All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today for the Beneath the Surface Lecture Series with Dr. Randy Wells. My name is Dave Bader. I'm the Chief of Operations and Education at the Marine Mammal Care Center. And we're so happy and proud to be sponsored by Marathon to make this type of, of lecture possible for everybody um, and to bring experts like Dr. Mm -hmm. Wells uh, to our audiences um, to learn more about marine mammals and um, some of the conservation issues surrounding them. So a little bit about uh, Dr. Randy Wells. Um, he is employed by the Ch Chicago Zoological uh, Society, although he's stationed at Moat Marine Laboratory in uh, Florida. Um, and he is part of the world's longest running study of a dolphin population in Sarasota Bay. Started in uh, 1970, although I'm sure he'll clarify me if I'm wrong on the details. Um, but looking at the impacts of, of humans and dolphins um, in this space with um, just a, a, a wonderful breadth and depth of knowledge about um, uh, those, these wonderful species that we find coastally. Um, I also have the pleasure of getting to know Dr. Wells through our, our projects and conservation of coastal cetacean species through a group of we call the um, ICPC or Integrated Conservation Planning for Cetaceans. Um, and that was born out of a conservation effort that uh, we both participated in for the conservation of the vaquita porpoise um, and learning more about the different types of cetaceans around the world that are similarly threatened. So it's, it's work from people like Dr. Wells that helps us to understand sort of the, the biology and the physiology of these really amazing organisms and to understand the, the ways that humans in, impact them and the ways that humans can work hard for their conservation. Um, work like this is critical for our understanding. So with that, I'm gonna throw it over to Dr. Wells for your presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Dave. It, it is a pleasure to be here and to be able to share with the folks out on the West Coast some of the work we've been doing on the East Coast for the last little bit more than 50 years. All right, so I'm, I'm here tonight as a representative of both the, the dolphins in Sarasota Bay that we've gotten to know so well. And as you can see examples of over the right hand side of the screen, and also a team of researchers that have been working with me, many of them for 15 to 30 plus years that have helped keep <laughs> these animals. We've been working with the dolphins in Sarasota Bay through the Chicago Zoological <laughs> Society, bless you. And if you're sneezing in the background, if you could mute, that would be great. Thank you. Um, all right. So we are a merry band of biologists, but we work with teams of researchers to come to help do the work in Sarasota Bay and expand their own studies from around the world. The dolphins of Sarasota Bay are a long-term resident population. We'll talk about this in more detail, but this particular figure shows one dolphin that was born in each of the 50 years, the first 50 years of the program and we can recognize them from distinctive markings on their dorsal fins. So our program, well, I get to admit people apparently, okay. Um, our, our program began in 1970 and it's become the world's longest running study of a dolphin, of a wild dolphin population only because we got there early and we didn't stop doing it. It wasn't because we had great initiative, it was for lack of initiative, we didn't do anything different, we just kept doing what we've been doing over the years. But we started in 1970 with an interest in what wild dolphins did. A fellow named Blair Irvine, shown over here, came to Moat Marine Laboratory to study the behavioral interactions of sharks and dolphins. And he brought with him an interest in what wild dolphins did. Up until that point, there was very little that was known about wild dolphin movements. There were a couple of examples of distinctively marked dolphins that had been seen repeatedly in some areas, but there'd never been a systematic study to look at what dolphins did whether ones you saw one day would be there the next or move their way around the coastline or out into the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. So Blair brought with him some newly developing tagging technology. And we went out in the waters of Sarasota Bay and began tagging dolphins. I was his high school volunteer at the time and began to get hints that dolphins along the central west coast of Florida might be resident to the area. We tagged dolphins all the way from southern Tampa Bay down into Charlotte Harbor and Pine Island Sound. And though the tags didn't work very well, they fell off for the most part, we began to learn from fin shapes and marks and scars on the fins 
that we were seeing some of these same individuals over and over again near where we had first put the tags out on them. So we got our first hints of residency at that point. In 1975, 1976, the US Marine Mammal Commission funded us to come back to the area. And in this time, we were using different tag designs and we were using these ancient radio transmitters. Well, they weren't ancient at the time, they were brand new at the time, they were state of the art. But <clears throat> technology has come a long way since then. But by putting these markings out on the animals, we were able to learn that, first of all, 11 of the 12 dolphins we first tagged back in 1970 and 1971 were still in the area. Not only were they short-term residents, but they were giving us hints of long-term residency to the area. And their movement patterns were showing us that they had a home range from southern Tampa Bay southward to um, the southern end of Siesta Key just down here. All these markings are locations of six of our identifiable dolphins from the mid-1970s. These dolphins would use the inshore waters especially. Along the west coast of Florida, we have a series of barrier islands with passes in between them that communicate to the Gulf of Mexico. Inshore, we have shallow seagrass meadows and sand flats. And these waters are up to about six feet deep and maybe nine feet deep in the channels. And we get to the abyssal depths of about 12 to 14 feet in the middle of Sarasota Bay before shallowing up again. But this is home for the Sarasota dolphins as we determined it through the 70s. Since the 1970s, we've worked with a variety of institutions, including the University of California, Santa Cruz, and our nonprofit Dolphin Biology Research Institute until 1989 when the Chicago Zoological Society brought me on board and we've been working with them ever since. And they've helped keep the operations going we moved our base of operations back to Moat Marine Laboratory, which is where it started in 1970 and 71. But working through the Chicago Zoological Society, we work still through Sarasota Bay on a regular basis. And let's see how we can make this go forward. There we go. All right, so our first discovery was probably one of our most important ones. And that was of the residency of these dolphins, that they had home ranges, which set the stage for the possibility for being able to protect them through management schemes. It also meant that we could find individuals repeatedly and predictably, and that set the stage for everything that we've done since then. So as an overview, this is a map of the area of the current home range of the dolphins from Southern Tampa Bay, southward down to Venice Inlet, and through all the inshore waters with our base of operations here at Moat Marine Laboratory on New Pass in Sarasota. We were able to determine that these animals used home ranges and they used them day and night. We had satellite lake transmitters that went on several animals back in 2012. We can see from their visual sighting locations, which are the yellow and the red locations, which are from the, the satellite link tracking, that the, the transmitters gave a pretty good representation of what these animals did. And in some cases, they allowed us to see that the animals extended their range even farther up rivers than we had first uh, thought that they had. But that these animals are on the move, day, evening, and night, they're constantly on the move. They're not spending time, one particular time of day in any particular location, but they're moving through their home ranges. And each of them have core areas that are within that larger community range that I talked about before. So we've learned that these animals live in a multi-decadal, multi-generational, year-round resident community of about 170 individuals. Over the time period since 1970, we've studied six generations, and this is spanning up to five concurrent generations, where we can have lineages spanning across five generations existing in the same waters at the same time. And the individuals have been known to live up to 67 years. As an indication of home range stability, this is our oldest dolphin right now, who's 51 years old. And she has used the waters over the decades. Each decade is a different symbol of a different color. Very similarly, she has a core area, the northern part of the area, but she will range through the entire community range at uh, one time or another. We have about 170 individuals that utilize the waters in Sarasota Bay at this time. And the age structure is such that we begin to lose the animals, especially once they've reached their 30s and going into their 40s, but we do have a few animals that make it into their 50s and 60s over here. 
This is an example of the home range stability across generations. This is a five generation lineage. Each color represents a different generation, each symbol a different individual. And it shows how these five generations of this maternal lineage utilize the range that we've described so, described so far. So they are very much home bodies. And they're not alone in this. We've done work up and down the coast, up in Tampa Bay and down in Charlotte Harbor to the south. And we found that there's a set of communities in Tampa Bay and other four communities up there that adjoin to the Sarasota community, which extends down this way. And to the south, we find additional communities through Lemon Bay, Pine, uh, Charlotte Harbor, Pine Island Sound, Gasparilla Sound as well. And while these are primarily behavioral differences that we find where the animals tend to put most of their movements into these given areas with rare movements outside, there's also a genetic basis to it as well, although not a major genetic basis to it. So this is, these home ranges form a mosaic up and down the coast and they're defined by ranging patterns, by social associations and by genetics. So our, pro, our approach for studying these animals is longitudinal monitoring. That's following animals through their lifetimes. And we study their biology, behavior, health, and their ecology of these individuals and their ecosystem. And that's an important aspect of it. We learned early on that trying to study these animals in a vacuum just didn't work very well. We needed to be able to understand the drivers behind what they did. And that meant studying aspects of their ecology. So within this unique natural laboratory, the basic thing that we do is keep track of individuals. We're out every month taking photographs of the dorsal fins of the individuals to keep track of them, them understand their condition, their reproductive status, their associates and their ranging patterns. And that contributes knowledge to our understanding of the residents of the area. We also periodically engage in health assessments, which are brief catch and release sessions with veterinary teams that allow us to get a snapshot of the health of the individuals and learn life history information about them as well. We also engage in purse sailing to learn what fishes are available in terms of the prey fish the dolphins might eat. And so we go out seasonally, we catch the fish, we identify the species, measure them and release them over the side. The food of the animals is just one half of the ecological equation. The other side of it is their predators. So we also have one of our postdocs working on tagging sharks, bull sharks like this one especially and obtaining information on their diets and their ranging patterns in the area. We obtain samples remotely when the dolphins are not in an area where we can do a, a health assess, assessment where we can stand in the water with them. And this is using a well-tested biopsy dart technique. Taking advantage of the well-known cast of characters in the area, we engage in focal follows, focal animal behavioral follows, where we at intervals record the activities of the animals um, so we can systematically quantify the behavior of the individuals. From time to time, depending on the questions that are being asked, we may tag and track the animals. This is the more recent version of that large tag that I showed you before. This is a satellite link transmitter that operates on a single AA battery and sends a signal up to a satellite, sends it back down to a receiving station, and we can pick it up via email, and it'll tell us where the dolphin is anywhere in the world. And in some versions, it'll tell us how deep it's been diving and how long it's been staying down but a much smaller package than what we had from the 70s. We also have established a network of passive acoustic listening stations. Much of what happens under the waters that's of relevance to the dolphins has an acoustic basis to it. The fish make sounds, boat noise is important in terms of an indicator of the human activities that they're being faced with. Invertebrates make, more, make noise, the dolphins themselves make noise. So we've established a network of solar powered hydrophone stations around the bay that allow us to keep tabs of the dolphins and their environment remotely. And then finally, we work closely with Moat Marine Laboratory's Stranding Investigations Program. We study the animals from the time they're born. Moat picks them up when they come up on the beach. And between us, we can understand something about the factors that are influencing the lives of these animals. So we've been able to learn a fair amount about them over the last 50 plus years with life history studies, we've been able to, to look at uh, things like reproductive parameters. We know that females mature at about five to 10 years of age. On average, they give birth at 9.6 years for the first time. We have had females as young as six give birth after a 12 and a half month gestation period. Males never mature, oh, sorry, that's humans. Um, male dolphins mature at about 10 years of age. 
We find that most of our births occur during the, this late spring and early summer. There's a 12 and a half month gestation period. Of our pregnancies that are diagnosed with ultrasound during health assessments, 83% of those result in live calves being born that we're able to observe over time. And keep that number in mind as we talk about the Deepwater Horizon oil spill a little bit later on. The mothers are anywhere from six to 48 years of age. We've had several 48-year-old females give birth and successfully rear their offspring. We've seen them with up to 11 calves over the course of a lifetime. Usually they have different sires for those calves. They typically invest about three to six years in each calf, but that varies with their age. Uh, with an average separation of about 4.2 years. And we see the females reach reproductive senescence. And this is when they've gone more than 13 years without producing a calf. The fathers, as we've determined from paternity tests with Debbie Duffield, Portland State University, are anywhere from 10 to 43 years of age. And they've been identified as producing up to seven offspring per sire so far. But that's likely to change as we, we continue to observe these animals. We've had the opportunity to look at their social patterns as well. And that was the subject of my master's thesis back in the 70s. We've identified the fact that they live in a fission fusion society, meaning that the groups change composition quite frequently. They don't live in families or pods like um, many are fond of, of believing that they do. It's not mom, dad, and the kids. And they don't live in pods. Peas in a pod can't go anywhere. And yet we see a lot of flexibility in the groups that, that we see. So for Something like killer whales, oftentimes the term pod is a really accurate descriptor, but for bottlenose dolphins on the west coast of Florida, not so much. We typically see the animals in groups of about three to seven with three basic social units. Nursery groups are the largest groups, and those will be moms with their most recent calves. And these are females that have similar, lo similar levels of dependence that they're working under, and it makes sense for them to rear their offspring together. The next largest group that we see are juvenile groups. And these will be kids that have left their moms before they've become fully mature. And it'll be of mixed sex up until the time that they mature. And then one of the more interesting aspects of the society that was first defined for dolphins in Sarasota is that of adult males that are in alliances, long-term stable pairs. In fact, when the males reach sexual maturity, they stay in the pair bond until one of them dies. And this unit provides them with increased reproductive success. It also provides them with protection from a variety of threats and probably helps them with their foraging as well. The social structure of these animals involves acoustic communication. We work in an estuary where the waters are pretty murky, and so we don't really have the opportunity for these animals to see much that's going on, but they do keep in touch acoustically. Research in the 1970s was focused on whether or not dolphins can speak English. Our work has been with folks at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and the University of St. Andrews, and it's focused more on how they use their sounds themselves rather than what we can teach them to do. And it's focused on understanding signature whistles. The dolphins produce three different kinds of basic classes of sounds. They produce the echolocation clicks or sonar clicks. They produce the raspberry kinds of squawks and blats that are uh, burst pulse sounds. And then they produce whistles, and they can provide, produce a huge number of whistles, quite a variety of whistles. But each individual dolphin has developed its own individually specific whistle that has a different whistle contour. And that's referred to as its signature whistle. It was first hypothesized by David and Melba Caldwell back in the 60s, and has been demonstrated for dolphins at zoological parks and in the wild at a number of locations. And in Sarasota, we were able to help confirm this by recording dolphins during the health assessments. This little party hat here is a hydrophone or an underwater microphone on a suction cup that allows us to know which dolphin is making the sounds at any given time. And then we would play back these sounds to dolphins just before they were being released and look at how they responded to them. And by playing these recorded signature whistles back to individuals, we learned that they responded much more strongly to kin and to close associates and gave us the first hints that these were identifiers and subsequent playback research has demonstrated that these dolphins tend to use these signature whistles as names, either to keep track of one another or contact one another. So this figure right here is probably somewhat hard to see, but it's 209 recordings or 269 recordings 
of signature whistles showing the contours of those whistles with frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. But these, much like the dorsal fins I showed in my very first slide, these are the names of the dolphins in Sarasota as far as they're concerned. And just as an example of what a signature whistle sounds like, I've got a recording here of a mother and a calf that are exchanging whistles and keeping in touch with one another as the mom makes whistles, her son makes whistles and they go back and forth here. And you can see the distinctive shape of these whistles over time. So let me know if you can't hear this, Dave. I think we can hear it. Okay. And so they are keeping tabs on one another, letting each other know that everything is okay at this point. So these whistles are very distinctive. They stay stable over time. They are developed over the first few months of life of the calf. And they may change over time to some extent, but they remain pretty identifiable throughout much of the animal's life. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many other kinds of whistles they produce. We're beginning to get a sense that these animals um, have other uses for different kinds of whistles, but it's just at the beginning stages of being able to understand that. So as I mentioned before, it's important for us to try to put these animals into an ecological perspective. So from stomach content studies on stranded dolphins done by Dr. Nelio Barros to observations in the field, uh, we've been able to learn about what these animals eat and what kinds of, of fish they prefer. And bottomless dolphins will eat pretty much whatever's available to them there, but there are some guidelines to what they seek out. These are the kind of the top 10 species that they eat. And we look at fish like pinfish as kind of being the rice that forms the basis of everything else. There are more pinfish than anything else available to them and they eat more of them than anything else. But they actually selectively take fish that produce sounds, soniferous fish. And basically it's a situation where they're letting the fish hoist themselves by their own petards. The dolphins don't have to echolocate to find the fish. They can just listen to the fish and zero in on them in that way and let the fish's own sounds guide them in to become lunch. So they take sound producing fish of a variety of species at a higher proportion than they're available to them in the environment. And among the fish are this tasty little morsel here, the toadfish. We'll try the sound. Isn't that just yummy? And somewhat better looking and equally noisy spotted sea trout. So when the dolphins encounter these, they're more likely to go for them than they are for fish that don't make any particular kinds of sounds. So the dolphins learn a lot over the course of their three to six years that they're with their mother. And the, only the first two years or so, or even less, are when they are relying on their mothers for nutrition, when they're getting their milk. The rest of the time seems to be spent in learning. And among the things they're learning are feeding behaviors. And we see feeding behaviors uh, being taught to young and to other individuals in the community as an example of cultural transmission of knowledge. And among the behaviors that we see being transferred in this way are something called fish whacking where the dolphins will be moving through shallow waters, they'll encounter a fish, they'll go after the fish, the fish will turn to go in the opposite direction because it's more maneuverable than the dolphin and it's not faster. And then the dolphin will whack it with its tails, with its tail and send it flying, oftentimes stunning it, and then go over and pick it up. And you'll see this being practiced by offspring, not quite as successfully until they really get the hang of it. Kerplunking is another behavior this involves a dolphin taking its fluke and lifting it out of the water, driving it through the water column, creating a geyser and a bunch of bubbles and getting fish in shallow waters to move away from their hiding places. You watch the mothers do that. They do it quite skillfully. You watch the calves do that. They lift their tails out of the water and they fall over to the side or they try it again and fall over to the other side. So it takes some time for them to get it right, but eventually they do. Other learned behaviors are catching catfish. Catfish have venomous spines on their pectoral fins and on their dorsal fin, but the dolphins have learned to sever the tails, which are all soft, and leave the heads out there. Oftentimes, the catfish will be swimming along without a tail for as long as it can before it bleeds out. 
that there have been examples that Nelio found of 50 tails in a single dolphin stomach. But this is all a learned behavior to keep from getting those venomous spines. And then unfortunately, they also learn how to interact with anglers. Once they're fed by someone, either a discarded fish or thrown bait or something like that, it reinforces that behavior of the dolphin approaching the boat and it's passed on from generation to generation. So this kind of learning, this observational learning has taken a toll. We've been able to observe a number of lineages out there. These are two examples of it. Vespa's lineage has four generations. In this case, any box that's red or any circle that's red indicates that the animals engage in human interactions. A slash means it's deceased. A plus means that it's been injured by human interactions. And as you can see, there's very few animals in Vespa's lineage that have not felt the effects of interacting with humans. And she is one who spends a lot of time around anglers and uh, raising her offspring in that area. So all the generations have been impacted by that. Squiggy in a similar situation where fishing gear, fishing interactions have led to the injury or demise of many of the individuals. This is one case, a dolphin named Toro down in Charlotte Harbor who had line embedded in in her dorsal fin and wrapped around her flipper almost to the point of it being severed. We rescued her, brought her into rehab and released her um, without the gear and, and hopefully she's no longer doing that sort of thing. But what's we, what we've learned over time is that those dolphins that engage in human interactions early on, the conditioned dolphins early on, have a higher probability of injury later on in life from those interactions. They're, once they get started, they're on a bad trajectory. And then when they share that with their others, their other associates, it becomes a bad situation. So one of the main issues that we face in Florida is trying to encourage people to do the right things around dolphins when they're out angling. This is borne out through the stranding program that we work with at Moat Marine Laboratory, where we do the cradle to grave work. They pick up the animals, they do necropsies on them to understand what brings about the cause of death. And as summarized recently for the 94 cases where they could determine a cause of death, the number one killer for these animals is fishing gear interactions. And this is almost all recreational fishing gear in Sarasota. Sometimes crab trap entanglements are an issue, but uh, gill nets have not been allowed in the area in, in large scale since the mid 1990s. So this is almost, this is primarily recreational fishing gear interactions that are the cause of greatest human uh, originated deaths for these animals. But these animals don't get to choose which threat they're gonna be facing at any given moment. They um, have to deal with disease, failure to thrive, potential predators, stingray barbs, harmful algal blooms, fishing gear, whether it's recreational or in some cases, commercial fishing gear, crab traps. When uh, we are in stone crab season, like we are right now, there will be 10,000 individual stone crab traps within the home range of the 170 Sarasota dolphins. Each one has its own float line. So it's a maze up and down the coast. And it typically results in mortalities, especially of young dolphins that have not experienced it before, but also manatees and sea turtles as well. It's quite an issue for these animals. Other things they have to face are uh, human provisioning of them, which does nothing but reinforce bad behaviors and makes about this much sense. Boat strikes are an issue. Uh, about 5% of our dolphins show indications of having been struck by a boat. Rarely is it fatal, but sometimes it is, as in this case. We have pollution from uh, pesticides. We have noise from uh, commercial, for, from construction in coastal waters. We have in other parts of the Gulf of Mexico, noise from military activities and oil activities. Fortunately, we haven't had that in Sarasota yet. But we do have other industrial activities. We have habitat loss with mangroves being cut down and seagrasses being filled in, pesticides from runoff, people feed the animals, and then climate disruption, which can have an, an impact on these animals as well. Where some of these things come together, where we really learn that it is more than one threat the animals have to deal with at any, any given time is when we have a harmful algal bloom. Red tides are not uncommon in our area. Mild red tides have been documented since the 1500s, and they are expected to occur every year and every couple of years. But we've had increasing numbers of severe red tides. And by severe red tides, what I mean is that this little dinoflagellate right here 
blooms, the conditions have become right for it to reproduce like mad, and you start getting cell counts of more than 100,000 red tide cells per liter of seawater. And it begins to turn the water reddish brown. This is the beach, this is inshore of the barrier islands, and this is just offshore of the barrier islands. And when you get these cell counts that exceed 100,000 cells per liter, you start killing fish and you start killing manatees and seabirds and sea turtles and dolphins. So one example of a severe red tide that we had was in 2005, 2006, where for most of the year of 2005, cell counts were at fish kill levels. And the cell counts ranged up to as many as 10 million cells per liter. When you can still count the cells, it's not so bad. It's when the cells start breaking up and releasing the neurotoxins that they contain, the brevitoxins, is when you start getting the, the kills of the organisms. So one of the things that we learned during that time was that our dolphins stayed, even though the situation got to be very bad. We didn't have that many dolphins that died as a result of the brevitoxins themselves, but we saw a 75% decline in their prey fish. Their food source died or went away. And so we weren't quite sure how they survived after that, but they shifted to more abundant uh, small schooling fish called clupeids that actually can survive the red tide very well. But we still had a 10% decline in abundance of Sarasota dolphins. We lost half of the two-year-old calves, which are the ones that are engaging in weaning at that particular time and trying to learn how to catch fish. The remaining ones were 20% underweight. And more, even more importantly, was the fact we saw a marked increase in human interactions at that time. If we look over here, we see the number of, of confirmed individuals that engage in human interactions and the number of new ones. And we see with this red tide, we saw a great increase in the number of occasions and individuals of dolphins interacting with humans. And basically, this is the dolphins and the anglers were attracted to the same place where the few remaining fish were and they were vying for the same fish. So we lost 2% of our resident population from ingesting fishing gear during this severe red tide. It wasn't the red tide toxins that got them, but it was the ecological effects of having lost their prey and, trying to, and having to resort to what was left at the same time that anglers were trying to go for the same fish. Another example is a severe red tide in, uh, in 2018 and 2019 which also brought about physiological and ecological threats, but we saw less in the way of human interactions. We had very high cell counts, up to 90 million. And again, it only takes 100,000 cells per liter to start killing things. We did see a number of our dolphins die as a result of the brevitoxins this time around. It came in hot, burned hot, and killed a number of individuals, at least four, probably more. It moved in in a different way. It came in from the south and moved to the north through the bay rather than coming in from the west and severing all the connections to other places where, where fish could go. We saw the dolphins again remained in the area, but they moved up into creeks and rivers to a greater extent where red tide could not uh, survive. And while we, did, we still saw declines in body condition of young animals, it wasn't as bad as it was in 2005 and 2006. It didn't last long. It didn't, well, it, it killed off a lot of the prey immediately, 88% of the prey disappeared as a result of the red tide. The animals were able to survive by feeding on the clupeids, the small schooling fish. We were able to determine that from stable isotope analyses. And because the red tide didn't last as long, um, the animals had a chance to come back into the bay. It was burning hot as many of the fish that breed offshore were offshore, or as their larvae were offshore. And when the larvae came back into the bay after the red tide had passed, there weren't as many predators around. So we actually found that the fish populations bounced back very quickly. So we did not see the same sort of interest in fishing gear, just putting a point on the fact that red tides are different and that ecological impacts are different. Instead, what we saw that was that our animals were doing, uh, were suffering at the hands of predators to a greater extent. And I'll get into that in a minute. We employed a new tool in trying to study this. We just, when we first developed our listening network around the bay, and these listening stations are able to pick up the sounds of dolphins, the sounds of boats, the sound of soniferous fish, and even of manatees in the area. And so we were monitoring these listening stations when the red tide came in. And this is at this particular listening station a month before the red tide came. Now let's see if I can play this.
So the basic take home from this, and I'll go through it again, but the basic take home is that there's a lot of noise. There's this carpet of noise down here. And these are fish choruses. And in this case, this is frequency again along the Y axis and time along the X axis. And every bright line is an indication of sound being produced. So um, we see echolocation clicks from dolphins in here. You hear snapping shrimp in the background as an invertebrate that's quite common in the area. You hear a lot of fish choruses and grunts over time. Um, and there are dolphin whistles in there as, as well. This is a happy, healthy ecosystem before the red tide. One month later at the same location, this is a spectrogram again. And the only pink that you see is an occasional, very lonely toadfish. You don't hear the dolphins. You don't hear the, the snapping shrimp. If you looked at the surface, it looked just fine. All the dead fish had been picked up off the beaches. They weren't floating around anymore. It looked like it was just fine. But an indication of the health of the ecosystem comes from being able to put your head under the water and listening to what's going on. What it's supposed to sound like. Echolocation. Whistles. And so we've been installing these stations around the bay so we can keep track from one place to another of what's going on. And we can actually track individual dolphins from one station to another based on when their signature whistles get picked up. So we can remotely track them around the bay. I mentioned the sharks before, and we've seen record numbers of shark bites on our dolphins in association with this red tide or just beyond this red tide. The red, red lines here are fresh shark bites per year going from when we started our fish surveys on. And what we find is that in those years when we have fewer stingrays that we catch, we have higher numbers of shark bites. And stingrays are a major prey item of, of sharks in the Sarasota Bay area. And we suspect that what's happening is when the rays went away, they either died, which many thousands of them did in the bay, or they left the area with their red tide. The sharks, when they came back, were looking for a prey source and dolphins were it. We saw a disappearance of, of many of the young of the year calves, more so than we would have expected otherwise, and they just become bite-sized morsels. Jane Gardner at New College noted that in August, when the red tide started to come in, red tide cell counts went up, and the yellows and the greens, the sharks and the rays disappeared. The sharks came back early the next year and through the summer, but the rays didn't come back for quite some time. So here, rather than it being a human interaction situation that was a red tide impact on the dolphins. It was more of a natural situation, predators, situ predators entering into it. One of the things we've learned over time is that for those aspects of the dolphins' lives that are as a result of human activities, we can engage in mitigation. We can go through education, outreach, rescues. But we've learned that saving one dolphin at a time truly adds up. You're leveraging population level benefits at that point. So we go in and we do educational programs, we talk to people, we do PSAs, we put out books and, and pamphlets and, and uh, have town hall meetings. And we also engage in individual rescues at the request of the National Marine Fisheries Service to be able to catch the animals, remove whatever gear is on them, and ideally release them on site. But in some cases, like Toro that I mentioned before, they come in for rehabilitation at Marine Laboratory for a period of time. These Individual rescues can make a difference. This is a population viability analysis by a fellow named Bob Lacey, who looked at the success of the, the population, the trajectory for the population in Sarasota Bay with interventions, with us going in and helping them out, and without those interventions. And basically, if we can get especially females rescued at a point where they're still producing offspring, we get many more dolphins in return for saving that one. An example of this is this photograph. This is four mother calf pairs of dolphins. Three of the mothers had benefited from interventions. So without those interventions, there would be three fewer adults and their calves would not be in this image as well. So while it may seem like a lot of effort to go out and save one particular individual, it's more than just a feel good. It actually has population level benefits um, in Sarasota Bay as well and elsewhere. We carry our conservation training further. We bring in interns. We have interns that come and work with us and graduate students and volunteers and international colleagues. We've had more than 450 interns that have worked with us since the 1990s and a variety of folks, uh, citizen scientists and international trainees from around the world. 
many professors have what they call an academic tree that shows their academic roots, where they came from, and then their graduate students over time. This is our academic kelp. Folks in California probably can appreciate that more than folks in Florida. But we've had a number of grad students who have worked with us and gone on to do other good things elsewhere. The Sarasota dolphins also benefit dolphins in other places. Uh, they serve as a reference population because there is so much background inf information on these individuals. When there are issues with more at-risk populations, the Sarasota da baseline data can serve as the basis for comparison to try to identify when issues are happening, when, uh, when there are differences that can point to what the problems are in an area. And so when the Deepwater Horizon oil spill happened here off the coast of Louisiana in 2010, Sarasota served as the reference population. The health assessment data, the population dynamics data we had was all used for comparison for similar studies that we engaged with others in up in the heavily impacted waters of Barataria Bay, Louisiana and associated waters in Mississippi Sound. And this is a photograph from Barataria Bay during the oil spill. The dolphins did not vacate Barataria Bay during that spill. They were there, they were exposed. And they were five times more likely to have moderate to severe lung disease as compared to Sarasota dolphins. Lung disease is one of the more common things that stranded dolphins come in with. They don't have a lot of protective measures in that pipe that goes from their blowhole down to their lungs. And so they do suffer from a lot of respiratory issues. The disease conditions in Barataria dolphins were significantly greater in prevalence and severity than those in Sarasota Bay dolphins and consistent with what you would expect from oil exposure and toxicity. And probably most tellingly, there's continued low reproductive success in Barataria Bay. I mentioned before that 83% of our pregnancies result in uh, successful births. It's 20% in Barataria Bay, and that's not really improved over the decade. They have low annual survival. Year-to-year -year survival is only 87% for Barataria Bay as opposed to 96% for Sarasota. And these numbers are just not sustainable in that area. The, the effects of the, of the Deepwater Horizon on Barataria Bay and associated waters were long-term, chronic, and severe. And a lot of what went into driving BP to the negotiation table as opposed to going through a court case was when the results of the dolphin studies started coming out and the, the very clear impacts that their oil had had on those individuals. So in Sarasota, we, we also have the opportunity to test and refine new techniques and for being able to study animals in various places. One of the things that's been very useful in a variety of studies, they've been used a lot in research off the, south, the Southern California coast as well, is something called a digital archival tag. And this is a little computer that's mounted by suction cups and it stays on for up to a day and it records the sounds received by the dolphins or the small whales or the large whales. It uh, records their roll pitch in their yaw, their depth, their compass heading. It gives you a behavioral record of what the animals are doing and can relate that to the sounds that the animals are receiving at any given time. And so you can have the animal, you can hear what the dolphins are hearing as they're making sounds with one another, and you can understand how they're responding to things like boat noise, for example. We also have worked to try to develop these tags and make them smaller and smaller that are allow us to keep track of individuals anywhere in the world. So these little tags are now attached kind of like an earring with a single pin through the trailing edge of the dorsal fin. They fall off after the end of the battery life, which is a couple of months. But in the meantime, you get tremendous amounts of information with the animals. And we are working closely with engineers at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution to develop the means for actually putting these tags on without having to catch them, to be able to put them on bow riding dolphins. And while we have, we're still working on the aspect that would allow us to put it on the dolphins with the tadpole, which is a tag attachment device on a pole, uh, it was used successfully by colleagues of ours with a great white shark from bow pulpit here. They were able to put tags on two great whites last year. And so it already is a useful conservation tool. We just need to get to the point where it could be useful for dolphins. But some of these other techniques, such as the D-tags and the satellite link transmitters, have allowed us to learn about dolphins at other places in environments that are much more challenging in Sarasota Bay. For example, putting these tags on dolphins off Bermuda have shown us that some dolphins spend a great deal of time right around the Bermuda pedestal, while others 
will leave Bermuda and range widely, hundreds of kilometers away from Bermuda, around the Sargasso Sea and up around seamounts. And they've allowed us to learn that whereas the dolphins in Sarasota Bay can't dive any deeper than 12 to 14 feet, these are dives for Sarasota Bay up on this top line here. Dolphins off Bermuda dove as deep as 1,000 meters, the deepest diving bottlenose dolphins of which we were aware. And with D-tags, we were able to, to learn that these dolphins are feeding not just at the bottoms of these dives, as you might expect, why else go down that deep, but they're also feeding at other times as well. So the tools allow windows into these animals' lives like they've never had before. And they allow us to keep track of individuals that have gone through interventions, ones that have been either rescued or rehabilitated. So we can learn how successful they are once we put them back out into the wild and learn where they go and how they spend their time, how deep they're diving. You get a sense of what techniques of rehabilitation are most successful and most useful to, a try, to try with future animals out in the wild. And we can apply the techniques and the expertise we get to dolphins in other parts of the world as well. Dave mentioned the fact that we were involved with him on work with uh, vaquitas uh, a number of several years ago down in the upper Gulf of California, but we've worked with colleagues around the world, especially with Franciscana dolphins down in South America, where they're getting taken out by artisanal uh, gill nets at unsustainable rates down here. Uh, we've worked on Mekong River dolphins, the last vestige of a population of river dolphins up the Mekong River. We've commented, we've um, worked with colleagues and consulted on Chinese white dolphins, finless porpoises on the Baiji before it disappeared. So we do what we can to take what we've learned from the dolphins of Sarasota Bay and apply it to the benefit of other dolphins in other places. And so there's these benefits to long-term study. It allows us to establish baselines to define normal ranges of variability and that can provide context and perspective and facilitate detection of trends. For example, on the positive side of environmental changes, we've seen a decline in the concentrations of environmental contaminants, such as PCBs, DDTs, and chloridane in the dolphins of Sarasota Bay over the decades that we've been measuring these contaminants in the tissues of the dolphins. It allows us to establish and test standardized approaches that can facilitate comparisons over time and across study sites. And that can do things like facilitate more work like what happened in Barataria Bay, where we're also doing similar kinds of work in Brunswick in Georgia, one of the highest levels of PCB at a, a super fun site in the world. And most importantly, it allows us opportunities to learn about the full richness of the lives of these long lived animals and to appreciate them as individuals. They definitely are individuals. They've got their own dramas. We recognize them and understand them by watching them through their lives and have come to greatly appreciate them as the individuals they are. And uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you for caring about Sarasota's dolphins, spending the last bit with me about that. And I would be happy to take some questions at this point, Dave. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Randy. Um, I am going to reclaim the host and uh, if anybody has any questions if you want to uh, type it into the chat um, or if you would like to uh, raise your hand we can take a few questions at this time well i'm getting off easy yeah <laughs> yes you are <laughs> Um, we're getting some thank yous um, out of our, our chat function as well. Um, Randy, would you would you speak a second about um, that association that I talked about earlier, the, the ICPC and, and sort of what its hopes are? Sure. Um, the ICPC came about in large part because of the Vaquita situation. And um, you'll have to tell me, Dave, have you already had programs on Vaquita up there? No. Vaquita okay. is a little porpoise that lives only in the upper Gulf of California or the Sea of Cortez. It was first discovered to science in 1958, and it is now the most endangered cetacean in the world. There's probably fewer than 10 individuals left. We're hoping to get an update, I understand, um, shortly, but there are very few individuals left because they've been taken out in fishing nets. Not fishing nets directed at the vaquita itself, but fishing nets to take um, a fish that is also endangered in order to get swim bladders 
to be able to send them over to China for the black market. But these nets are catching fish that are of similar size to the porpoise. The porpoise gets caught and they are, they are killed. What we learned a couple of years ago was that there have to be many more tools in our toolbox for conserving these animals than what we had available. And so we engaged in a last ditch effort to try to catch a couple of the vaquitas, bring them into protected custody, basically where we could take care of them for whatever period of time was necessary in order to get all the threats removed from the upper Gulf, at which point they could be put back out there once all the fishing nets were gone. But in order to do that, you need to know how to take care of the individuals and they've never been maintained under human care. And there was no expertise for being able to do that. And so there were few, too few dolphins, too few porpoises left to be able to really get the baseline information we needed. The efforts to catch and to hold them were not successful. And it was due in large part to not having had the opportunity to develop the techniques when there were many more of the individuals out there. So in an effort to keep that from happening again with other very uh, at-risk populations of dolphins and porpoises around the world, a group of interested people came together and are trying to bring the expertise to the table that can help to gather whatever information is necessary to be able to bring a one health approach to these animals, to be able to utilize every aspect that's available in terms of conserving them, whether it's uh, removing threats to their environment, helping to get legislation in place to protect the animals, and also if there's the need for being able to bring the animals into human care for a period of time in order to provide the necessary cleanup of the environment or protection of them, have the expertise to be able to do that successfully. And so this group, the ICPC, is, is meant to try to get the word out and get colleagues involved in protecting animals in situations that are pretty dire right now and likely are to go, going to go the way of the vaquita if there isn't more concerted effort and successful background information available to make a difference for them. Did I do that okay? You did it great. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, we have a few questions that have come through the chat here. Um, first question from Heather Turks in out of Arizona, um, asking, how did you get started in the field? You mentioned uh, starting in high school. Yeah, I wanted, to I wanted to study sharks and my family moved from Illinois to Florida and just happened to move on to the island that had the world's finest shark research laboratory, Moat Marine Laboratory, at the southern tip. And so while I was in high school, I got to go there on field trips, and then I tried to get a volunteer job there, and I got turned down. But um, fortunately, this fellow Blair Irvine that I mentioned had just started there, and he was buying a house through my dad's real estate company, and my dad talked him into giving me an interview. And Blair brought me on as a volunteer between my summer, this, between my, my junior and senior years in high school and brought me on the payroll that fall for work study. And we've worked together ever since. But I got to study both sharks and dolphins on that project and help start the tagging program out in Sarasota Bay. Very cool. All right, uh, there's a question about um, Georgia. Are you familiar with a, a heavy area of DDT in Georgia? Um, yeah. Why there's so much DDT there? Yeah, that was the area that I mentioned off Brunswick that um, mm. there's uh, four EPA Superfund sites, I think, there. And one of them is the source of the highest concentrations of, of PCBs in any marine mammal anywhere in the world that I'm aware of. And it was a site where the chemicals were produced and dumped many years ago. And they're still in the process of trying to figure out through many subsequent owners, what kind of cleanup is necessary and what kind of cleanup is going to be productive in that area. So it's an ongoing legal case between NOAA and the owners of the property. And there's ongoing dolphin research to try to help guide those efforts as well. We have a similar situation out here in Southern California. Um, uh, with a DDD producer back in the 60s. So very similar to that, um, I'm guessing. With all the barrels opening up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very sad. Uh, we have a question. What happens to the dolphins that have been exposed to brevitoxin? You had uh, brought a slide up of that a little while ago. Yeah. Um, what we think is going on with them, we don't know for sure, is that they are a little bit different from the sea turtles and from the manatees and the birds. So when the brevitoxins are released from the cells, they bubble up to the surface and they form a, a 
volatile layer at the surface that decreases in concentration as you get above the surface of the water. So the manatees and the, and the, the turtles come up to the surface of the water and very gently open their nostrils and breathe at the surface. So they're getting just that very thick layer of concentrated toxin at the surface that they're mm -hmm. inhaling. The dolphins come up and they have an explosive breath. And we think that they might be disrupting that volatile layer enough that they can get to cleaner air and it's not as much of an issue for them when it's not a, an unusually high concentration of, of cells releasing the toxins all at once. So 90 million cells per liter, that's, that's a lot of poison. Is it a respiratory toxin or a neurotoxin? What kind of it's toxin a, is it? It's a neurotoxin, and it usually affects the animal's ability to, to breathe. So, so, <laughs> yeah, so if, if, for example, they find manatees that are beginning to show signs of brevitoxicosis, they can rescue them, they can bring them into clean water, clean air, and oftentimes they can get them to come back around again. Um, same with turtles, if they can get to them in time. In other mm -hmm. cases, it's just, it's just too late. Uh, um, we recently had an oil spill here off the coast of Southern California um, in Huntington Beach. And there's a question about, would we expect to see similar type of impacts on our, our local coastal dolphins that we saw in the Deepwater Horizon event? My understanding is that not nearly as much oil was released. It didn't cover nearly as much area. It was not present in the same concentrations for nearly as long. Um, as in the deep water situation. That was a, a truly horrific event. It, the oil kept coming for 90 some days, I think it was, mm -hmm. and millions and millions of barrels as opposed to what was it, 25,000 gallons or something that was- uh, 100, it ended up being like 120 something gallons. Okay. Um, but a thousand gallons. Right. Uh, but um, also, you know, our, our uh, oceanography is a bit different um, yeah. than than that of of those areas, and and perhaps that's a, a benefit to our local species. Well, and oceanography played a big part in reducing the impacts of the Deepwater Horizon too. The way the oil was moving around the Gulf of Mexico, it was headed for the Keys and then up the East Coast, mm -hmm. and instead it got caught in a gyre out in the Gulf of Mexico and diverted from that. But a hurricane coming through at that time could have disrupted that gyre, changed the currents, blown it onto the, the shore of the west coast of Florida. There are any number of things that could have happened, but it was a fortuitous set of circumstances that kept it from being worse than it was. Uh, we're going to move on to the next question. Can you talk about the biopsy dart and how that works? Yeah, the biopsy dart, it's a, a little stainless steel dart about as big as the tip that's about as big as the tip of your little finger. And it's shot from a crossbow or a, a rifle. And it goes into the, the animal below the dorsal fin and bounces out immediately with a small sample of tissue. And that small sample of tissue provides information on the sex of the dolphin, uh, its age from epigenetic studies, its population structure, uh, based on the genetics from the individual, environmental contaminant concentrations, reproductive hormone concentrations, stress hormone concentrations, um, information on diet from stable isotopes and from fatty acids, and an indication of nutritive condition based on the percent lipids. So all that information comes from a very tiny piece of tissue that heals up immediately. It's been done tens of thousands of times with dolphins around the world. And it's a very uh, successful way to get a great amount of information with minimal impact. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what behavior have you observed that has excited or impressed you the most? Wow. Anytime so I mean, the behavior of the dolphins is what I'm assuming. Oh, darn. You, you, are, you are in Florida. so I was going to tell stories about <laughs> you in Mexico, Dave. <laughs> they didn't want to do that. Um, for me, it's watching these animals from generation to generation and looking at how their lives unfold, looking at how their mothers rear them and how they learn from their mothers over time, seeing them pick up on the patterns and carry on through their lives. I, I, I can't say that's any one specific behavior, but it's just knowing that 
we're basically living in their backyards. Mm -hmm. Other people view it the other way, but we live in their backyards and they're allowing us to take a look at what goes on in the course of their everyday lives. And being able to, to look outside and see that and learn about these other creatures, making a living in a place where we wouldn't stand a chance of doing it is just is fascinating to me. Um, a couple questions here kind of along those lines um, about the vocalizations that you mentioned that you were able to study. Um, one question is about, uh, is there an acoustic fingerprint for each dolphin? I think you mentioned you can follow dolphins based on their signature whistles. Yeah, the signature whistles are individually specific. And the researchers who have done the most work with that, Peter Tyak, Leo Saig, Vincent Yannick, Franz Jensen, and our group have been able to identify them for all the dolphins in Sarasota that we've studied through the health assessment process. And even some where we've been able to pick up the signature whistles just through uh, remote observation and recording as well. But um, they are definitely like fingerprints for these animals. And I'm sure that the dolphins use that more to tell each other apart than they do their dorsal fins. Mm -hmm. um, with those uh, communications, are they just between bottlenose dolphins or is there any um, interspecies communication that you know of? It would be interesting to see what would go on in an interspecies situation. In Sarasota, we've only got bottlenose dolphins, so it's hard for me to say. But there are other species of dolphins that appear to have signature whistles as well. Mm. But I'm just, I'm not sure how the interactions would go there. All right, and the last question to take us out of here, is there a message that you can that uh, you would like to share to best support and perpetuate uh, your mission and your efforts? Wow, um, you said no hard questions. Um, <laughs> no, I, I guess mostly what I want to do is just get across the idea that we are stewards of the environment that, like I was saying, these animals have to live where they live. We're visitors, even though we may recreate or even make a living in the same waters where they live, this is their home. And we need to respect it as their home and do everything we can to preserve it as their home and allow them what they need to be able to continue to make a living out there while we enjoy watching. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Randy, uh, for joining us today. And um, if you enjoyed this, uh, we have a couple other uh, beneath the surface uh, Lectures coming up, we have um, Jamie Smith on December 2nd, um, and um, I'm now blanking on what she's going to talk about, but it'll be marine mammals, and it'll be fantastic. <laughs> and then uh, we're also going to have Iskande Larkin talking um, to us about manatees. Um, so something we touched on, we have a little bit of Florida coming to us, um, uh, and another really fantastic lecture um, that if you give me a second, I'm going to remember. Oh, heck. Anyhow, she's a fantastic person. Look for her on our uh, social media uh, and you'll see our advertisements for this. We have uh, a bunch coming up. Um, so please tune in, check us out. Uh, these are all going to be recorded and up on our um, website as well and shared via our YouTube channel. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Randy, for taking your time out of your day or evening uh, to speak with us as well. And we'll see you guys all next time. All right. Bye, everybody. Good seeing you, Elisa. <laughs>